Okay, um, Professor Williamson Chang has taught at the William S. Richardson School of Law in Honolulu, Hawaii for the past 44 years. He started at the age of 26 in 1976. He's a graduate of Princeton University and the University of California Berkeley School of Law. He was a member of both the California Law Review and the Environmental Law Quarterly. He has been special counsel to the Senate Select Committee on Indian Affairs and a senior Fulbright Scholar at the University of Western Australia. He is native Hawaiian, Chinese, and Scottish-Irish. He has consistently been an advocate for native Hawaiian rights in federal and state courts. He founded a nonprofit organization to assist small farmers with obtaining water rights. In 2017, he was named Living Hawaiian Patriot of the Year. Today, he will address how restorative justice, critical to his evolution as an advocate, and how, excuse me, today he will address how restorative justice has been critical to his evolution as an advocate, and how restorative justice has dramatically changed his strategy in his litigation for the sovereignty of Native Hawaiians. His presentation will address two topics. First, he will discuss how Native peoples, including Native Americans in the United States, will be of great value in resolving the deep divides in America today. Second, if time permits, he will discuss his vision as to the role of Native people in a future world changed by artificial intelligence, automation, and robotics. It is his request that he speak on the first topic for 20 minutes. There will be a 10 minute question, 10, 5 to 10 minute question and answer period in between, and then he will speak on the issue of Native people in the world of the future. Please help me in welcoming Professor Jim. Well, I want to say first, um, thank you so much. This is a real pleasure. Uh, you might not believe me because I came from Hawaii, <laughs> Kansas. No, I'm a refugee from Hawaii. You know, what is that? Um, everybody thinks of Hawaii is nervous. But I just wrote an article, well, not just, in 2016, which is good reading if you want to follow up on what I'm going to say, which is called Darkness Over Paradise. And you wrote, what is that? Yes, sir. You know, people come to Hawaii 10 million a year, but few know the truth of the Native ones. They're like the Native Americans. And there's, because Hawaii is this tourist attraction, their story really never gets told. And I'm Native Hawaiian. You heard Chinese, Scottish, Irish, which means I'm a citizen of the world, but also I oppress everybody. <laughs> I'm Chinese, Scottish, Irish, all the Native ones. But you know, it's like, I'm one of those people who can never sleep if there's any injustice in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I mean is, uh, I'm a law professor. You know, it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> calling. Uh, when I thought about the job that I had just been hired to do, I was inspired by something in Time Magazine. It was an article that said, the 40, uh, uh, under 40, 10 most gifted law professors in the world. And they had Ruth Bader Ginsburg, they had uh, Tony Amsterdam, they had Bruce Ackerman, they had Frank Zimmerman. I go, I read about it, and they, they got to do three things. They got to do scholarship, teaching, and they got to do community, they got to do litigation. I go, well, that's wonderful. You know, you can do three things. You, can, you, know, you, you know, the life of a law professor sounds really great. Who wouldn't like it? You get to schedule your own, you know, time. It's one to tell you, it's terrible life. <laughs> it's a terrible life. If you take, well, if you do what I do, and I don't recommend it, I became an advocate of litigation for Native Hawaiians. In the first cases, it was really successful. Actually, because I represented the street world. I said, what? <coughs> well, and it was the Chief Justice was William S. Richardson, who the school I come from is named after. What he had done, he was the first Native Hawaiian Chief Justice since the King. And there's an overthrow, and I'll get to that. And law, our law had been torn topsy turvy, so that it reflected Western values, not the original Hawaiian values. And one of the problems was, for example, water was considered private property. That was not true in Hawaiian society. Private property that the sugar companies bought and sold kept it themselves. Mm. And they, they created this incredible industry. 
very profitable. And the Chief Justice registered in 1974. <coughs> this Supreme Court, it was made up of a you know, uh, Japanese person, Chinese person, Native Hawaiian, Jewish person. It was most diverse Supreme Court in history because they had just gotten statehood. And now the governor could appoint people that he wanted. Before that, it was appointed by the president. It was all mentioned, but I have nothing against white males. It was all white males. And there were sugar lawyers, that's, that's more deadly. <laughs> there were sugar lawyers, and they kept the system in which private, a lot of us private property alive. Well, the Chief Justice suddenly declared that one was owned by the state. It was in a public trust. And it's like, all the surface of the water of the state by one decision is transferred back to the state. And one day I was studying that case I had a little grant, and I said, you know, it, it was in litigation, it went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, we don't want to have anything to do with Hawaii. We don't know this Ahupua, us Kamehameha's, Kamehameha's, etc. Smart move. The sugar industry was very upset. So they sued the court saying it was a taking of property uh, under the just compensation clause. So I was involved in that case, and we won, and eventually the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, I got tarred, maybe not feathered, I got tarred. <laughs> because uh, the, the mainstream law firms were so upset with my, I guess, interesting arguments, that they actually sent people out to follow me, they sent they got awarded attorney's fees, and this is true, for stifling Professor Chang's ways. They called me into disciplinary counsel. Why? Because they said, I was creating an unfair atmosphere for a trial because, you know, I was speaking so often. Why? Because the Chief Justice of the judge could speak about the case. I was the female for the courts. And of course, that's that insane because it's an appellate case. There's no jury. So they, they went through the whole thing, but I was, you know, I went through this very, very, it's terrible to be brought in before this point counsel. Even if your patron is the chief justice, you receive I was lucky for those cases. After those cases, I said to myself, there was a, you know, there was a time, because um, I had found out that the sugar companies and their lawyers, after the overthrow, had manipulated the law. They had moved precedent all around. They redated cases. That was really awful. And I said to myself, if they were willing to cheat in that area, where else would they have cheated? And I thought to myself, maybe annexation, because we were annexed in 1898. Yeah, I'll go more depth. So I went to look at the congressional record as to annexation. Now, what had happened was this. <laughs> Americans <coughs> overthrew the Kingdom of Hawaii, which was a Hawaiian monarchy. And it was, you know, hierarchy, it was hereditary. American businessmen and expatriate Americans who came from the missionary families, the second generation, wanted to overthrow the natives. They felt we were, we were, we were frivolous and we were spending too much money. Iolani Palace, oh, what a waste of money. Uh, but Hawaii's kingdom was a sovereign in the nation, recognized by all the nations of the community of nations. And that community was a small club. This was in the 1840s. There were like 40 European nations who, after Westphalia, decided, OK, this is what sovereignty is. You've got to be civilized, so you have to have territory boundaries, and you've got to be sovereign. Uh, you know, Hawaii was, I think, the first terrible country to be given this status by the community. It was civilized, why? Because the missionaries came and converted our chiefs to Christianity. So you know, there's a lot of basically nations around the world. That, you know, the Iroquois, the Navajo, not nations, why? They're not Christians. Oh, so Hawaii, gets his status of being a nation. It has treaties with all countries of the world. Uh, our queen goes to the parade with Queen Victoria's coronet. 
Thanks, Monica. So it's in respect. Americans love Hawaii. You know, Hawaii, people in Hawaii are just so friendly. Everybody loves coming to Hawaii. And when they come back, they're asked, why did you come back? And they don't say, the beautiful islands, the streams and beaches, the volcanic lands. They say, it's the friendliness of the place. So this idea of aloha rubs off everyone. And it's true. Hawaiians are just open to everybody to their detriment. Are they violent? Yeah, there's Hawaiian men fighting every, other Hawaiian men on Friday nights. What do you call that? We call it high school football. <laughs> we're good at that. Um, but, I mean, there was a little warfare, but it was more like the NFL. Like, oh, today we have a away game, a Maui. And they come back, well, we beat them. There was no point in conquering anything because nobody could own any land. The king, you don't say he had tons of land, but nobody owned anything. He was a steward. He was top dog steward of the land. And then there was a ranking. Everybody had their responsibility. Nobody owned land, nobody owned water. It wasn't feudal because like, the tenants had great rights. They could move to any other place and live there. So the situation is, in 1893, these American pink expatriates with some foreign people overthrew our kingdom. And the United States lands 168 Marines. How many people are behind the overthrow? 13. 13 people, that's, that's like a little more than a football team. They overthrew our kingdom. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> uh, you know why I'm embarrassed? I come from a peace-loving people. I should be embarrassed. You know, I like to think of it this way. America is a nation made by war. Think about it. The American Revolution. The, the, you know, the taking of Mexican territory, the taking of the, taking of the West, the, the Native Americans. And then, of course, the wars overseas eventually. Hawaii, Hawaiians, the Hawaiian kingdom is a people made of peace. How are they going to survive in this cutthroat world? Well, they don't. In 1893, there's an overthrow. And the Americans who overthrew the kingdom went running to Washington and said, an excess, an excess by treaty. Make us part of the United States. And the treaty was brought before the Senate. And they said, this is really un-American. This is disrespectful. This is unconstitutional. This is a violation of the national law. We won't pass it. You need two-thirds to pass a treaty, right? I mean, they made it a little tougher. So the Americans had to like sit there in a little minority. There's only 6,000 of them. I don't know, 100,000. And rule without American assistance. Well, let me tell you, there was a gunboat in port every, every day. So American arms overthrew the kingdom. And what happened to the queen? The queen, would, could she have fought back? Yes. She had a militia of 3,000 men. They had very good rifles. And they could have won that little battle. Well, if you beat the Americans, kill Americans, some American blood is spilled, what happens? It's a justification for war. And he, she knew the Americans would come back. Right over. So she yielded, not surrendered, to the President of the United States and said, I put in you my powers. I trust in you that you do the right thing. At that time, the President was Grover Cleveland. He did the right thing. Maybe the last time an American president did this. <laughs> he said, oh, this is terrible. He announced to the American public, this is a violation of international law. This is terrible. This is wrong. It's immoral. We have treaties with these people with this nation, it's sovereign. And I'm going to restore the queen onto the throne and displace these Americans. Well, time goes by and it doesn't happen. Anybody want to guess why? Anybody want to guess why the president of the United States couldn't succeed having this huge military and restoring the kingdom of Hawaii and displacing the American who had taken power? Answer is simple. Americans are Americans. The idea of sending an army or military or navy to go into Hawaii and kill expatriate Americans, killing Americans to do what? To put a monarchy back in place? We fought a revolution to get rid of a monarchy. So there was like foot dragging in Congress. It was this limbo in which this tiny minority of 
white people rule Hawaii by implication of coercion. And it just sat like that until they got, you know, they finally got a Republican president. Democrats were good guys back then. The Republican president, well, he wasn't so nice. He wanted to follow the idea of expansion in the United States. He wanted to expand because America was falling behind the imperial powers of the world. He and Theodore Roosevelt, William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, Senator Kami Kevin Lodge, and Alfred Mahana, naval theorists, knew America had to expand. It had to go global. This is the start of what we know of America today. Hawaii is so important to the future of America in the United States. And so McKinley says, let's try a treaty one more time. They get a treaty, you know, the usurpers of the throne sign the treaty with the United States the Secretary of the State, and they try to get it through the Senate, and the Senate won't pass it again. They get like 55%, maybe. No, that's not the two-thirds necessary. McKinley's very upset. What happens? The United States manufactures a war in Spain. The battleship of Maine suddenly blows up in Havana Harbor. Everybody thinks, oh, it's Spanish sabotage. There's been six naval all concluded that the explosion came from within. How do they know? Uh, if it was a torpedo from the outside, they'd be dead fish. It's pretty simple. There wasn't, so you know, the United States did one of these provocative, let's start a war, pretend it was the bad guys, we're them, and we'll go in. So they went to war against Spain, and meanwhile, what are they going to do war against Spain for what purpose? Taking the Philippines as colonies? Taking Puerto Rico, uh, Cuba was spared, and taking Guam. Why was Cuba spared? Because one idiot senator from Colorado, uh, senator of Colorado, got up and said, "We are not colonial. We're not conquerors. We will give Spain, Cuba, its freedom." Because Cuba was fighting a war against a revolution against the Spanish. They regret that to this day. Cuba would be ours. Maybe it is already, <laughs> um, but. So in the middle of the Spanish-American War, well, at the very beginning, excuse me, President McKinley is advised, you can take Hawaii, you don't need a treaty. All it takes is a joint resolution of Congress. A joint resolution of Congress is just a bill or an act. It's like, today, we're going to celebrate the Dodgers as World mm -hmm. Series champion. Today, well, he was going to take another country by passing a bill Act or joint resolution that had no effect outside the United States? Yes, that was the plan. Some people thought Texas had been informed by a joint resolution. Not true, but I don't have the time to go into that. <laughs> I don't want to upset anybody from Texas, they're pretty proud. <clears throat> but the treaty didn't pass. So he simply said, I'm going to pass a resolution. Get a resolution. It only takes the majority. So what's happening? You don't need the two thirds of your majority. That passed over this incredible opposition, a filibuster by, you know, people, part, people from both parties say, not it's wrong, not it's unconstitutional, it's impossible. It's like me saying to some woman in this audience, I like you, I'm gonna get married. Here's my signature, here's yours. We're, we're married. And so he said, but you said both, so what? <laughs> The basis for the United States to take of Hawaii is that absurd. But nobody in Hawaii has known it for 130 years. Why? Because the United States didn't have anything better to say, and they want Hawaii, and they, they didn't have a treaty, so that's all that's left. And you fool all the people all the time. This is like the most, the greatest deception ever. They fool, they never have so many people been fooled for so long by a, such an you know, incredibly simple, stupid kind of claim. So what I discovered on that day when I was in the library was this volume in which senators were saying in the, in the Senate floor, what are you doing? This is impossible. They said the, the most incisive point was made by Senator Bacon from Alabama. He said, you know, if we can take Hawaii by a drug resolution, Hawaii could take us. Jamaica could take us. 
And so the senators went on and on filibustering. Only two senators came up to uh, defend them. And they had really foolish reasons. They passed. So here's what I discovered. I discovered the United States acquisition of had no crisis. Now what do you do if you're a law person you discover that in your native Hawaiian? Hmm. It means your people are free. It means they, there's no basis for the claim of jurisdiction. But it's a scary realization. In short, you can overturn the world if you're right. So, what do I do, foolish me? I take that, I condense it into a legal argument and bring it as an argument in subject matter jurisdiction. Courts don't have subject matter. Why the boundaries can't be written. The United States knew that. They said the boundaries of Hawaii are the joint resolution, what islands were required. So anyway, I bring this case, and I wish I could show, in the middle of this case, in the middle of my career, it's two decades long, I'm sanctioned by the judge in a federal district court under Rule 11E for $76,000. Was simply uttering this, making this claim. And it's done. You know, law professors like to be a right wealthy. But also, they don't want to be like considered criminals. They don't want to be like sanctioned, the greatest sanction in the history of Hawaii. And you know, it was a warning shot. Stop. Stop. You're going to be trying to undermine the United States. The date was. September 8th, 2009. What happened three days later? 9-11. People say, you don't be a terrorist. <laughs> you don't be a guy. I was a professor me. You know, I do this research. And I'm right. The question answers, yeah, it doesn't matter. But my people need to know this truth. And so I was stunned, and the question came up. What do I do with? <coughs> and I think that a lot, a lot of people would say, you did the wrong thing, Mr. Chang. I didn't do anything. I didn't appeal it, I didn't challenge it. Why? Because the critical point was I was beginning to realize some of the points were story of justice. It was critical that I respect the rule of law. Like, you know, when Martin Luther King led people, People got arrested, they got beaten, they, they submitted to the law. In other words, I had to show sincerity, authenticity, and respect for the law. But I went into this huge depression. So what I want to say today is, we have to consider trauma to advocates in this process. I mean, we, the advocates, the story of advocates for battered women, etc. We don't, we, we don't include them, but the, they're victims too. I was, the only thing that saved me was realizing that my trauma could only be addressed by restorative justice. Mm -hmm. So I went through this process of trying to get to it. Nobody's helping me. Nobody would talk about it. I lost all my friends. Go, this is the nut case. <laughs> he doesn't believe there's, you know, Hawaii's, you know. And so what happened just last year was the Supreme Court reminded me by saying to me, by excluding my testimony in a very critical case, we're excluding it because Professor Chang doesn't believe the state exists. And I was upset again, they traumatized me again. But guess what, I had to do. I was coming out of a hospital where I almost died, internal bleeding, and I realized life is short. You don't have another 20 years to fight this. Figure out something. So I turned to science and looked at psychology. I began to analyze my clients in terms of that. On the other side, I began to see that people respond with closed minds if you keep pressing them on something. For example, let me just test this. If I say every one of you is beautiful and handsome and smart and wonderful, that was what I'm talking to you, you'd say, no, I'm not. I push, no, I really are, no, I'm not. In other words, if you're convinced of something, that's not how you, you actually, science shows you get even more settled in your bias, in your views. And that's what's happening in America today. Right, left, blue, red, 
You know, I, I see it. People are yelling at each other. There's not, they're not even hearing it. So that's where I am today. And so we'll take a break here. The thing is, what would you do about it? You have this most powerful weapon that law be device. And I, I, you know, I gotta admit, I was stuck in legal theory. You know, I'm in my head, that's professor, right? We're not, we're not right. The story of justice is put aside theory, practice first, we derive theory from practice. So I'm gonna take some questions. Uh, I'll probably follow up with this. And then maybe I can just touch on what I was gonna do in part two. So any questions? I have a question. Yeah. How many times did you get recognized as a TV star? None. None? <laughs> I recognize you from Out of Ruins Everything. Oh, okay. And I just want to say thank you for uh, ruining Hawaii vacation. You know, nobody in Hawaii <laughs> saw it. So the second part is really this. I'm looking at my situation. I'm looking at the United States. Who can not help but watch MSNBC? The United States is terribly divided. Everybody knows that. The future is what? In 20 years, in 10 years, in 20 years, Oxford University study says 40% of 47% of the jobs in the United States will be automated. The, what we're looking at is artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, completely turning our world upside down. And we're not we're not even thinking about that. In other words, when I was near death. I realized we better do something fast. Let's think about what really, I was like, oh, don't go for the home run, go for the single of the lanes. Like, lay out a plan where we can have an autonomous area. But the point I want to make really is we have things to resolve in the United States. Let's start with indigenous people. They have been suffering, but you know what? They're the, they're the keepers of the plane. Because they've been sincere. They're connected to nature. They have suffered terribly. I call me a terrorist. Look at what the United States did to the Cherokee, etc. They were too harsh on us. They just wore a piece of paper. Unfortunately, we believed it. And we're not, we're not warrior people. We should have sent our football players out. <laughs> but the United States has to come through a reconciliation with native peoples. Because the future is this. Right now, you all work very hard. I know you do. The meaning of life is your work. And you, you know out there, your fathers, your cousins, they all work hard. But look at what's happening to agriculture in Kansas. It's taking it over automation. It's going to get much worse. A lot of people are going to have this state in which they won't have work. What's going to happen? Either it's going to completely break down, or people are going to find meaning somewhere. Than and the key is, where is it going to come from? Well, the trauma that has been transmitted over generations for Native peoples has kept their original sense of nature, spirituality, and alive. Making peace with Native peoples, Native Americans, is a way in which a lot of the guilt in the United States is It's something no one talks about. It's something I want to talk about. But think of it, native peoples were here. They're, they were here, and then people came over from where all countries in the world. The difference is they have choice. They keep it by choice. And the, this is home, somebody else's home. I'm Chinese. Do I worry about whether there's going to be Chinese food in the future? <coughs> no, there's 1.3 billion people taking care of it. Do I worry about whether there's going to be Chinese language? No. Because I can go there. Hawaiians have a home in Hawaii. If their language is extinguished, it's all gone. You know, if their ways are extinguished, it's all gone. Hawaii is facing a crisis, and I, I put this challenge out there to establish common ground with other stakeholders, like not clients. I'm saying, can your children live in Hawaii? <coughs> you know, the price of housing in Hawaii, the median price of housing is 870000 yeah, you're not moving to Hawaii. It's nice to visit. <laughs> Nobody can afford to live there. Everybody's got all, everybody's children is moving out. And if Hawaiian children leave, there's nothing left with the Hawaiian people. This doesn't live with the Hawaiian race. But it's also true of everybody else. So I'm saying native Hawaiian sovereignty 
is the engine which can address any of the crises. Because we have this claim, and the United States, once it recognizes the seriousness of this, has to come to terms. And so restorative justice is so hard when the United States is diplomat. He can't sit down and say, how do you feel about this? Who are you talking about? Institutional defendants make restorative justice very hard. So a lot of the initiative has to come from. So I'm saying uh, my view of the world is completely changed. Law is not it. Law and the legal, as we know it, it's restorative justice, it's common ground, it's negotiation. The future is too short. Things are going to change. If artificial intelligence, robotics are replacing people, our armies are going to be robotic. Who needs, you know? And so they, where are the people going to go? How are they going to work? People are leaving. You know, maybe it's Kansas. But agriculture is, is one of your prime industries. Think about the automation of the agriculture. And so we have this divide where white males in Wichita are saying, you know, I don't want these immigrants to get ahead. I want my state in the future. How are we going to answer that? Universal income? We have to think about that. And that changes completely the dynamics in which law we'll operates. On the day to day level, restorative justice is really powerful. But the bigger questions are kicking the can. Because they are embracing their clients' crimes. 